environmentalist response to the planned destruction of one of Istanbul's historical green spaces uh, rapidly became this heterogeneous political movement that coalesced around a common critique of rising authoritarian nationalism under the uh, leadership of the Justice and Development Party. Hickman's poem Invitation, or Davet, let me see if I can get this to work. Um, so Hickman's poem Invitation, or Davet, was used repeatedly throughout the protests as a rallying cry. Um, its final stanza in particular, uh, which actually I think is in, in the book as well, um, it was chanted in public squares in Istanbul and written on placards. Um, the final stanza is, to live like a tree, solitary and free, and like a forest as brothers. This longing is ours. Though persistent references to Hick through these persistent references to Hickman's poem, the protesters drew a through line between the poet's death on June 3rd, 1963, and the occupation of Gezi Park precisely 50 years later. Can we advance again over there? We go. Um, so uh, the, the poem's final stanza was, it was really uniquely fitting uh, for the occasion because it blended the natural imagery of the threatened Istanbul Park with this larger democratic vision of its occupiers. The same vision, one for a future community joined together by democratic and humanistic ideals, imbues Hickman's expansive body of poetry um, with this hopeful longing that I think we've talked about a bit today, and continues to make his poetry relevant today for diverse political and social movements, both in his native Turkey and around the world. Um, we already talked about that he's, he's an interesting person to be Turkey's foremost modernist poet, as he was born in, you know, what is now uh, Tessal Thessaloniki, and he died in exile in Moscow in 1963. Um, he was banned from publishing in his native Turkey for the majority of his adult life, um, though he became a potent political symbol, um, both during his life and, and in the decades following his death. In life, he was a beloved poet and a dissident hero, both in Turkey and uh, among an international leftist community. Um, he was wrongfully imprisoned, we know, from 1938 to 1950 on charges that he had attempted to incite the, the Turkish Navy to revolution um, with his communist poetry. His poems were found in a Navy dorm room. And he was subsequently exiled from the Turkish Republic from 1951 until the end of his life in 1963. Uh, viewed as a threat to the Turkish Republic, um, the young nation at the time, uh, Turkey was called, uh, uh, Hikmet rather, was called a Vatan Haini, or a national traitor, um, by foes, and, and by admirers he is called Shaya Baba, or father poet. So struck by this resonance of Hikmet's poem at Gezi Park, I went on to write my dissertation on Hikmet's afterlife in literature and politics. Entitled A Shared Longing, the dissertation identifies a constellation of references to Hikmet's poetry both in Turkey and in Turkish communities in Germany, um, which I'll talk about in, in, during the panel today. Uh, the project also explores what these widespread allusions to Hikmet's poetry and biography can tell us about the way uh, communities are both represented in and created by shared texts. Each of the chapters focuses on a single literary work in which Hikmet is referenced, uh, while also exploring the poet's broader, shifting cultural significance. For example, um, in the first chapter, I explore an allusion to Hikmet's poem, uh, The Encyclopedia of Famous Men, on which uh, Human Landscapes, which we've heard about today, is based. Um, in the 1971 Turkish novel, uh, Tutlamyanlaj, or The Disconnected, by Oğuz Zatay. Um, uh, I compare Atai's rewriting of this poem of Hikmet as a series of, bit, of obituaries at the end of, um, of The Disconnected to the widespread cultural practice of quoting Hikmet in the death notices of leftist victims in the build-up to the, in the violent build-up to the uh, 1980 military coup in Turkey. Um, I argue that Hikmet is reinvented in this moment 
um, as a leftist speaker for the dead, and his poems were used as an alternative either to a religious language or administrative discourse uh, it, it, to speak about death and the dead. Once I began looking for contemporary references to Hikmet, I found them absolutely everywhere. Um, his, I think my advisors thought I was choosing quite a narrow subject, just looking at the, the legacy of this one figure, but it's so expansive that, I mean, I mean the, the book won't cover it. Um, his words were carved into a memorial by a subway station in a busy Berlin uh, train station, sung in loose translation by uh, American folk singers Paul Robeson, Joe Baez, Peter Singer, um, and scattered among the pages of novels and books of poetry for the last half century. My work took me to archives in Turkey, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, and the United States, and yielded a trove of documents and ephemera through which Hickman's memory was not just commemorated, but also continuously refashioned. Um, it's worth pointing out that um, uh, the sort of historical context um, of Hickman's legacy at this moment since the end of the Cold War, Turkey's national leaders on the right, in particular, have consistently downplayed Hikmet's communist legacy and revolutionary politics and claimed him instead as a sort of nationalist poet. Um, Hikmet's citizenship was quietly restored in 2009. Um, Arslan Turkesh, who is the founder of Turkey's historically neo-fascist National Development Party, National Movement Party, began selectively quoting from the poet in the early 90s. And former Prime Minister, now uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and his wife Emine Erdogan, both have regularly cited Hikmet in their political speeches over the last 10 years. Most, uh, most recently, Hikmet's words were used to mourn the victims of a failed coup attempt on July 15, 2016. Um, Kemal Kilic Darolu, the minority leader in Turkey, and Prime Minister Binali Yildirim, both sides, in other words, recited a different Hikmet poem to commemorate the victims' lives in a bipartisan ceremony. Um, you may have seen this. This was at um, Istanbul's very um, uh, iconic Yeni Kapa port, and it was held like the late August 2016. So many of these contemporary nationalist usages um, sort of erroneously recast Hikmet um, his embrace of vernacularization. Um, so this idea of using the everyday speech as language, as an acceptance of a sort of strident um, authoritarian brand of nationalism, uh, this idea of sort of linguistic supremacy. Meanwhile, the majority of Hickman's afterlife, of course, is comprised of these rewritings and reprisals of his work in postmodern novels and quotations of his poems in anti-authoritarian and anti war, social movements. In light of this recent appropriation, um, uh, there's a pressing need for scholarship that analyzes both his revolutionary poetics and their long and rich, his, rich history of reception um, in literature and politics. Um, so my talk today focuses on Hickman's afterlife poetry, that is, on the poems that specifically, uh, where he addresses his hopes, his fears, his anxieties relating to his afterlife. Um, by focusing on these poems and on the context in which he wrote them, we'll see how Hikmet, in fact, helped create a cultural narrative for his afterlife that centers around the death-like effects that authoritarian nationalism had on his life. So, spending so much time with Hikmet, um, in some ways, over the last five years, I have marveled at his staying power. On one hand, it's no wonder that the man that uh, novelist Orhan Pamuk has called the most extreme exemplar of Turkey's great and guilty writers, um, that is, writers who are incarcerated, should remain significant today. The injustices that Mark Tickman's life serve as pressing reminders today that our greatest minds and our freest thinkers are often the targets of the most vicious abuse in authoritarian contexts. Moreover, Hikmet's tremendous talent and particular importance for Turkish literary modernity, um, it seems like it, is, it, it, it seems predictable that he'd become so, so well-loved and so, and so remembered. Yet on the other hand, it's just not a foregone conclusion that lives like Hikmet's will continue to be so fervently admired, and there are myriad talents that fall by the wayside or lose favor throughout the years. Instead, I think there's a compelling case to be made that Hikmet's powerful legacy is due, at least in part, to his own active participation in crafting and authoring his own afterlife. Um, 
Near the end of his life, Hickman often wrote about his death, and I think we've, we've heard a little bit about how he thought about death, and he said, you know, what, what are you going to do? You're going to go crazy, you're going to forget it. Um, and, and in particular, he, he thought a lot about how the world would continue beyond his death. Um, sometimes these poems are tinged with sadness, as in the case of a poem called Days, Gunlaj, in which he laments his inevitable end. Uh, beautiful days in the future, they won't see me. At least let me send them my regards. He's speaking to the future. He said, I'm dying of sorrow. In other poems, he attempts to shake off these thoughts of death and live fully in the moment while he still can. Um, as in the untitled poem that begins, I stripped off my thoughts of death. I donned the June leaves of the boulevard. In a few rare verses, the poet indulges in a little gallows humor, as in the poem, My Funeral Ceremony in which he imagines all the potential follies of the ceremonial processions. He humorously speculates about the awkward journey with his coffin down the narrow staircase of his apartment building, the curious children who would inevitably cluster around his body, and the pigeon who might leave a parting gift on his forehead. <laughs> uh, will my funeral position starve from the courtyard? How will you carry me down from the third floor? There's no way the coffin will fit in the elevator, and the stairs are much too narrow. The kitchen windows will watch me as I go. They'll carry me past the balcony with the laundry hanging out to dry. I lived more happily in this courtyard than you will ever know. To my fellow courtyard dwellers, I wish you long life. So despite their varying tones, these poems share a lot of common themes that are central to Hickman's work. Um, on one hand, the constant encroachment of death on his life, and on the other, the assured persistence of his life beyond death. Um, and I don't mean that in a religious sense, in the sense that people would remember him. Hickman is famous for his inspirational political poetry, um, in which he frequently and exuberantly declares his own immortality. Less well known, however, are the darker afterlife poems, um, he wrote during his lengthy prison sentence when subjected to a litany of inhumane conditions, Hickman often depicted his incarceration as a form of death and himself as an animate corpse. So by looking at some of these darker and largely ignored poems, we'll see that they in fact necessitate the eternal life that's postulated in his later and more popular poems and lay the ground for Hickman's remarkable afterlife that continues today. So, uh, we've, uh, in many ways, Hickman's afterlife began while he was still alive. Um, by the time Hickman died of a heart attack at the age of 61, he had either been incarcerated or living in exile for nearly half of his life. This meant that, say, for this very brief period in 1950-1951, between his release from prison and his escape to the Soviet Union, Hickman was removed from Turkish public life beginning with his 1938 arrest. Um, he never saw the Turkish publication of the majority of his written works, among them Human Landscapes from My Country, um, as he was a banned author for the entirety of his incarceration and exile. Throughout his life, Hickman often contemplated and wrote about death, due in no small part to uh, the torture and inhumane conditions that he endured during his trial and sentencing. <laughs> At several moments, Hickman believed that his death was imminent. He makes this fear explicit in a poem he wrote to his wife, Piraya, while serving a briefer stint in prison uh, from the spring of 1933 to the summer of 1934. Death, my corpse swinging at the end of a rope. My heart can't accept such a death. But you can be sure of it, my love. If some poor gypsy's hairy, black, spider-like hand slips a rope around my neck, they will look for fear in Nazem's blue eyes in vain. So with its stark imagery of this machinery of death, Letter to My Wife stands in contrast to the poems that he would write during his subsequent prolonged period of imprisonment. Um, these later poems are much less concerned with the possibility of imminent physical death than with the death-like experience of imprisonment. Reacting to his 28-year sentence that was doled out by a military court in 1938, um, Hickman writes to Piraya um, that he now understands the court's intention all along was to see him buried alive. And he imagines that he will return home as an old man crippled and brain dead. As is evident in both his correspondence materials and in the myriad death-themed poems he wrote for prison, 
Hickman viewed the social and psychological effects of his incarceration as something akin to death. And Hickman isn't alone in thinking of the condition of imprisonment as a virtual or social death. Um, literary scholar, scholar Caleb Smith points to the connection between unnerving, inhuman, eerie representations of prisoners in literature and the development of the modern American prison system. He writes, the legal, material, symbolic violence of the penitentiary regime works to turn the convict into a kind of animate corpse. Writing about the effects of incarceration on the human psyche, sociologist Joshua Price describes three conditions of imprisonment that make the experience into a form of social death. Systemic violence, degrading and humiliating treatment, and alienation from familiar relations. The permanent loss of rights that has often accompanied criminal convictions in Western societies is known as civilitaire mortis, or civil death. And this can be seen in the contemporary American context in the permanent disenfranchisement of individuals convicted of felonies. It must be quickly acknowledged that uh, the conditions in the prisons where Hikmet was held were, were different from those of the contemporary American penitentiaries, and Hikmet enjoyed periods of intellectual productivity and community life. Moreover, the stigma that Hickman faces as a political prisoner is clearly distinct from that of most individuals incarcerated in the United States. However, he endured and witnessed torture, underwent periods of forced isolation, and experienced continuous emotional and psychological pain due to his separation from his family. In many poems from this period, Hickman imagines his own place in the world somewhere between life and death. We see this most clearly in a lesser known poem from 1947, near the end of his incarceration, entitled Bir Ulinizvaj, literally translated as You Have a Corpse or You Have a Dead Person, um, but rendered here more idiomatically as A Dead Person Lives With You. The speaker, who is never identified as a prisoner, describes the dead as a ghostly presence in his own family home. He roams the house at night for months before eventually receding into the background, later reappearing only at the most terrible moments of loneliness. The addressee, the, the person that the poet is speaking to, is the speaker's beloved, the one accustomed to sharing a bed with the dead. The beloved is moving on, allowing the intensity and the pain of loneliness to die down. The sorrow wore off, the poem says, together with the worn out sheets. She keeps photographs of the dead, but looks at them without ever truly seeing him. For the first three stanzas of the poem, the poem can be read literally, giving the reader no reason to think that the dead might in fact be a metaphorical construction, a proxy for a living person. The ambiguity enters into the poem in the final two stanzas. A dead man lives with you, in the dusk like all dead men, in the dusk one layer closer, but indistinctly distinguished. A dead man lives with you. He lies in a tomb. His flesh hadn't rotted, hasn't rotted. His hands and feet quiver. In the second to last stanza, the dead man is not simply a dead man, but like all dead men. That added like opening up some interpretive space between the idea of dead men and the con this dead man and the concept of death itself. The couplet that follows um, expands that space further. The dead man is closer to the, to the living than the others though hardly distinguishable from them. In the final stanza, the repeated first line, a dead man lives with you, lends itself to a gruesome reinterpretation. This dead man quivers, a living, breathing soul, his flesh still intact, lying entrapped in a carceral tomb, not a, not a real tomb. A dead man lives with you might be read as a figurative rewriting of a 1943 poem by Hickman entitled Aisha's Letters which is thought to be a poetic reworking of the letter sent by Piraya uh, to Nazim during the early years of his, his sentence. In the poem, a young woman writes 48 poem letters to her husband, Halil, who is serving a lengthy prison sentence. Each letter tenderly details the events of her do domestic life with the couple's daughter, Leila. The letters open a window to a world from which the incarcerated man is absent, a home life filled with gaps where Aisha's husband ought to be. One letter begins, I'm writing this letter, lying in bed, sick. If you were here, how well you'd take care of me. The two hypothetical clauses in the second line emphasize the missing husband. And an exchange Aisha recounts a few lines later likewise highlights the missing father. I'm writing a message to, Le to Dad, Layla, I said. Dad? Who's Dad? She said, yawning. 
Though the letters themselves contain few details of Halil's life, they place the reader in his position, recreating his experience of, re -read, of reading his wife's letters and imagining his own absence. One can imagine uh, the, the, the first poem, you, you Have a Dead Man, as Halil's view of the world represented in Aisha's letters, one in which his painful and prominent absence transforms into a ghostly, even dreadful presence in the house. Written four years after Aisha's letters and nine years into his sentence, You Have a Dead Man cannot be read solely as an expression of hopelessness. Rather, it reveals Hikmet's sustained meditation on the death-like social condition of incarceration, um, which will later become the basis of, uh, of his own writings on his afterlife. So though Hickman's darker verses about his incarceration are not often referenced by politicians and protesters uh, today, they help us to understand the perspective from which he wrote his more popular inspirational poems with themes like immortality and eternal life. Prominent among these is On the Fifth Day of the Hunger Strike, which Hickman wrote in April of 1950. Hickman's hunger, hunger strike, which provoked international outrage, um, came in the wake of a failed attempt at release from prison as part of a general amnesty. He would eventually be released, released in July of the same year when his sentence was reduced. The poem is a rallying cry through which Hickman refashions himself not as a victim, but as a heroic idealist. The poem describes first like a deathly, rapturous state and sets forth a vision of a democratic community um, which he connects to his supporters enduring memories of him. My brothers, I have no intention of dying. My brothers, I know if I do depart this world, I know I will keep living in your minds. The transformation in this poem from a man close to death to an immortalized hero is indicative of a close relationship between those two roles that Hickman fashions for himself in his poetry. The heroic afterlife is a necessary antidote to Hickman's premature social death. The passage from an animate corpse to an immortal idealist not only rehabilitates the poet himself, but redeems the nation that brought about his social death in the first place. Today, although significant forms to the Turkish penal code have eliminated the articles under which Hickman was convicted, other major challenges to democracy have emerged. And today, Hikmet's afterlife continues to captivate national attention and tether itself to the national, in the national imagination to tur the Turkish Republic's complex negotiation with uh, democratic ideals. We see this nowhere more clearly than in the enduring public debate over the poet's remains. In the poem Testament, Vaziet, in which Hikmet, which Hikmet wrote from um, exile in Moscow in 1953, the poet famously asks to be buried in a village in Anatolia, quote, and if it's not too much trouble, a plane tree could be at my head. Um, the, the, the poem continues to inspire high-profile pilgrimages to Hikmet's Moscow grave today. These pilgrims bring, uh, bring Anatolian, Anatolian soil to spread on, on the Moscow grave, or, or else they take handfuls of earth from Moscow and bring back to Anatolia. Um, here's just some pictures of, of these, these pilgrims coming to, coming to Moscow. Um, the earliest publicized uh, pilgrimage was perhaps that of Ankara's mayor, uh, an architect named Vedat Dalokai, who in 1975 was investigated on sedition charges for bringing Anatolian soil to Hikmet's grave on an official visit to Moscow. <laughs> in an article about Dalokai's graveside visit, leftist journalist and poet Ahmed Oktay wrote that he too had visited the grave and left flowers from Anatolia. Oktay expresses how Hikmet's life and death mediate his contemporary Turkish identity. Quote, Whenever you travel to another part of the world and you tell someone you're a Turk, they say, quote, that means you're from Nazim Hikmet's country. This has happened to me many times. I feel both pride to have come from the same country as Nazim Hikmet, but also shame at the injustices that we have done to the poet, even now, so long after his death. An active campaign to return his body to Turkey, begun by the Turkish, Turkish Writers Union on the poet's 75th birthday in 1977, regularly resurfaces in the Turkish press at moments of heightened political tension. Since the Gezi Park protests, many, including um, 
Kilin Shnarl, the, the opposition party leader, have called for the return of Hikmet's remains to the Istanbul green space to, to move Hikmet's remains from Moscow to Gezi Park. This is a symbol-laden proposal to bring the physical remains and with them Hikmet's legacy of democratic idealism to the heart of, of Turkey's largest city. The sustained call for the return of the poet's remains is tied to a shared vision of a democratic society. In his 1977 speech announcing this campaign, um, Aziz Nesin, who at the time was the chair of the Turkish Writers' Union and is a famous satirist and author, he proclaimed, quote, we will fulfill our great teacher's Vazia testament only when democracy prevails in our country. Like Hikmet's other afterlife poems, testament ties Hikmet's legacy to the future of the Turkish nation. Many believe that his resting place will depend on the self-understanding and shared ideals that the national community espouses. Um, so by linking Hikmet's later inspirational poems to the earlier darker ones, we see how the poet's virtual death through incarceration ultimately generates the need for the cultural narrative of his eternal life. His active and enduring legacy in Turkish political life is a form of that is a form of national redemption for his premature social death during his lifetime. In this enduring afterlife narrative, the poet comes to stand in for other incarcerated writers and free thinkers, and his abiding presence becomes a reminder of their absence from public life. Hikmet, who is the originator of this shared cultural narrative, continues then to hold sway today, ensuring that his legacy has a necessary role to play in the ongoing negotiation of democratic ideals. Thank you. Turkey might be comparable to um, the area of Arab McCarthyism in the United States. So uh, people being arrested for um, being either accused of being communist or writing sort of socialist or leftist poetry. Um, and it was the build up to the Second World War when Turkey was sort of between, betwixt and between various, uh, between uh, the two sides basically. And so there was this, uh, I think the Italian penal code had been adopted. And, and, and so it was this sort of like proto, it was like a sort of fascist peel code that was particularly sensitive to um, any critique, any criticism, and particularly uh, attuned to the power of poetry and literature. Um, uh, in terms, yeah, and, and then the other person I sometimes, when I'm, yeah, my, my family's American, so I'm like, oh, he's sort of like Martin Luther King, you know. He's, <laughs> Quoted, you know, it, 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 it memory only seems to have grown over time, and I think there are important differences between them, um, but but important similarities as well. I think it was their 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 power as sort of revolutionary political leaders combined with the tragedy of their lives that makes them sort of enduring. Uh, it gives them enduring importance to movements today who see the job of carrying on their memory as sort of a redemption of, uh, of, of, of the sort of political wrongs and, and uh, you know.